Okay, so my name is Celine, and this past summer I have been working very closely with Dr. Milly on a research project. And the main um, goal of the project was that we were trying to understand what kind of self care practices that were being done by adults in the US. Um, so today I will talk a little bit about what is self care, why is it important, and how do people do self care, what does the literature actually say in terms of what people are doing. Um, in terms of self-care and what kind of activities that have been shown to be beneficial for health and what we did for our project and just share a little bit of the results that we found um, with you. So I'm just going to share my screen right now. a little longer than expected. Okay, perfect. So first of all, um, what is self-care? So self-care is actually defined as actions taken purposefully by an organization, community, family, or individual, and it has to have an intention of improving one's health and well-being. So as much as we love our bubble baths and spa weekends and all of that is great for self-care, what we're talking about are things that people actually do with the sole intention of improving um, your health. And this definition is pretty nuanced. When I was looking through the literature, there was um, very different definitions that was thrown out there. And a lot of them were actually using the term self-care and self-management and self-efficacy sort of concurrently, but they're actually different. So when we talk about self-management, they're actually actions that people do on a day-to-day -day basis for them to manage a chronic disease that they have been actually diagnosed with. And when we talk about self-efficacy, it's more of a sense of perception and self-belief on how well they are able to manage their chronic disease. So the main difference between these three concepts, so self-care, self-management, and self-efficacy is actually the population that we're talking about. Because self-care actually includes people with and without chronic diseases, whereas self-management and self-efficacy actually includes people with chronic disease only. So why is it important um, to talk about self-care and to actually do self-care? So as we all probably know, chronic diseases epidemic is rising and there is a very strong, you know, big need to actually prioritize this problem. So 60% of adults in the US actually have a chronic disease and 40% have two or more. And globally, it's one in three adults that have a chronic disease. And the main four are, you know, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and um, lung disease. So I feel that self-care is actually in a very good um, position that is very strategic because it actually helps in terms of primary prevention for people without um, any chronic diseases, but it's also great for secondary prevention for someone um, with a chronic disease. So it actually supports individuals in their management. So it works concurrently and it complements self-management that we talked about a few minutes ago um, in terms of their management of chronic diseases. And it also helps prevent any further complications so that whatever chronic diseases that was diagnosed, it doesn't get worse. And so Celine, also, oh, sorry. Yeah. Maybe we can just um, say a couple of examples of what self, of what um, management, self-care management would be versus just regular self-care. Okay, so self-management, for example, if someone actually has diabetes, um, checking your blood glucose, that's self-management, or checking your blood pressure if you have hypertension, or if someone actually has like um, a wound and it's like a chronic condition, managing the wound and cleaning that, that's self-management. Um, and then when we talk about primary prevention, it is something that prevents getting current disease to begin with and that self-care actually really promotes health and well-being and it also manages um, stress. So when I looked into the literature, there was a lot of information on how people actually do self-care and it can be done individually, as we all know, but it can also be done in a group. The difference is that what is recommended is if you are doing self-care and it's a very simple regime 
and you know it's sort of like a one size fits all kind of thing and it's a very simple message then it can be done as a group and doing it as a group also pro actually promotes a sense of community and people actually you know get to know each other and all that and that which we will talk a little bit about later is also a part of self-care to have that sense of belonging and community Whereas if it's a very complicated regime and it's something that's very complex and it's very individual and personalized, then it's best to be done um, as an individual. Self-care can also be led by a professional or lay people. And it has been found that if it is actually being led by a professional, it is more effective, even though they're both actually useful. Um, Location-wise, it can be done anywhere, pretty much. You can do it in your own home, church, hospitals, schools, um, wherever, and it can be done virtually, just like Nightmare Coach, or in person. And there has been research that has found that um, it is equally as effective. And when it comes to virtual self-care, it can actually be more cost-effective and it can actually reach more people um, geographically. So when we look into, we were trying to find out what what was what is the current situation when we talk about self-care? What are people doing and how much? So self-care was actually only previously studied among people with a chronic condition. So not with anyone without a chronic condition. And this is actually not captured in any national survey. So we don't really know what people are doing. So what we do know is that there has been reports of people being involved with complementary and alternative medical practices. And we can actually gauge um, on whether or not people perform some form of self-care whether through their involvement um, with CAM. So most CAM users were found to be adult women with higher education and income levels. And in the UK, there was a study that found that those who actually practice self-care also had some form of poor health. So when they actually have poor health, that's when they start doing self-care. Um, and then the social study found that baby boomers practice only half the amount of self-care compared to millennials, even though they actually reported that they had poor health and they were financially struggling, but they only did half of the self-care compared to millennials. So that's what we know from the literature. What we don't actually know is what what are they doing? What are people doing in terms of self-care? And how often are they doing it? What sort of frequency? Because it has been identified that it is actually the most effective and if it is done regularly and consistently. So it has to be like your daily routine for it to be the most effective. And we wanted to also know if people are doing these activities, were they even effective? So before I actually designed the survey, I looked into the literature to make sure that the answers and the questions actually reflect um, things that matter, things that actually were beneficial for health and not just any sort of self-care um, that are promoted out there. So I'm not gonna go through the five domains of self-care into detail because I know we had a previous sec um, session on that already, but just to briefly go through it. So the physical domain are activities that promote physical wellness. So it can be physical activity, having good sleep and eating well. Psychological domains uh, focus on increasing your self-awareness. So it could be therapy or it could be writing a journal. And emotional domains promote emotional wellness. So spending time with friends and family, experiencing laughter, those are emotional. Spiritual are activities that help find purpose or meaning in life, and that can be meditation or being in nature. And the fifth domain is professional domain, and these are activities that focus on your professional health and competence, so like, you know, development and training, seeking support if you need. So after looking into these studies, which basically were a lot among social workers, um, I also looked into longevity studies, so studies that look through the blue zone, so areas in the world where people's life were very long, they live really long and healthy lives. And the blue zones um, team actually came with the term power nine. And these are nine things that they found in common despite the various locations of the blue zones around the world. So firstly, they have movement within their daily life. And I want to just emphasize that when we talk about this, it's not setting time aside to go to the gym or setting time aside for exercise, but they actually have movement in their daily lives as the default option. So for example, they don't drive, they walk most of the time, 
or they have a garden and they just go out there do gardening and then get whatever um, produce they have and then cook um, indoors. So they don't set specific times. It's more of just, it's part of their daily lives. They also have a purpose in life. They eat plant-focused diet. They drink alcohol moderately and regularly. So this is one to two drinks per day and they can be done with friends or family um, with or without food. They also belong to a faith-based group. They stop eating when they're 80% full. They have a community and they have a very great way of managing stress and they do it by ensuring that no matter what, they always place their loved ones first. And they also choose having social circles that really support healthy habits and being around people that share the same um, goals in life. And then looking into further studies, so centenarian studies, and we found that they had higher consumptions of vegetables, lower levels of stress, they had higher physical activities, which is actually one of the biggest um, main, actually main theme that helped promote their lifespan. So all of these were actually, you know, very, very correlated with the five domains that actually the first four domains that we talked about. So I pulled these information and developed the survey that way. The reason why we didn't include the professional domain is that because it is very personalized and it can vary from industry to industry depending on where you work and what career you're in and also the level of um, where you are in your career. So what we did, so um, I created a survey. We looked into the demographics of people, uh, whether their age group, their income, education, things like that. And then what sort of activities that they do. And like I said before, these activities that I listed in the survey were actually things that was found to be beneficial for health um, through the literature research already. And then we also wanted to know how often people were doing self-care. Was it once a year or was it done every day? Um, because we know that if it's done regularly and consistently, that's when it's effective. And then there was an open-ended question asking people, what are your goals? Why do you do this? Um, what do you hope to achieve um, through your self-care practices? And then we wanted to know what they thought. Was it effective? Did they personally feel that what they were doing was effective? Um, I collected responses through social media. I have to say that our sampling method and um, this type of sampling method was actually biased because we looked into groups of people who were already interested in chronic disease prevention, interested in self-care. So through Facebook, for example, we promoted the survey and recruited people to answer the survey through groups um, who already were interested in chronic disease. On Instagram, I looked through um, people and individuals and reached out to them through hashtags that were associated with self-care. So, and the same thing for Twitter. We also use Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing platform. And this is probably the only one platform that we use that actually were not um, people who already mentioned that they were interested in chronic diseases um, or self-care. Our inclusion criteria were very simple. It was just adults 21 and above and living in the US. So we included people with and without chronic diseases. So, our results, we had 193 respondents, and now I will go through um, some of the things that we found. So I'm gonna just move my screen over to share with you the respondents that we found and how the data, what the data showed. So this is a dashboard, and as we can see, it's the map of the US, and these little blue dots actually mean that they were respondents and this was where they came from. And we can see that it is pretty widespread throughout um, the country, but it's not representative of the entire US population. We were missing people from various states like North Dakota, South Dakota, and due to you know, budget and time constraints, we were not able to obtain a larger sample that, was a, that will be able to um, cover the entire US population and be representative of that. So people who responded to our survey, um, I just wanna point out, so this is the dashboard that looks at the age of the people that um, responded to our survey. And because our sampling method was biased, because the people that we recruited were already people who were interested in chronic diseases prevention and self-care, we can say that the demographics 
are pretty representative of people who do self-care. So the larger the rectangle, the more people belonging in that group. And the darker the intensity of the color means there's more people in that group as well. So in the age group of 21 to 29, we have about 30% of respondents, total of 62 individuals. And then 30 to 39 age group, we had about 53 individuals, which made up 27%. So together, the 21 to 39 age group make up more than half of our population that we actually found. And it's interesting because uh, remember I mentioned that baby boomers were not actually participating in self-care and it's actually reflective here. Um, just to mention that this little rectangle here that doesn't have a label, it's actually people who, for individuals who responded and prefer not to um, disclose their age. So that's the age range that we found. We also could be biased there because we're reaching out to people on social media. So that's, yeah, selects for younger people. Mm -hmm. Although Facebook is old, tends to be older and Instagram tends to be younger. But it is a very biased way of sampling people anyway. So in terms of gender, um, pretty obvious here. So 66% were females who responded to our survey and only about half of that 31% were male. Um, I just want to mention as well that we included trans male and trans female into our answer options and nobody identified as um, trans male or trans female. So this is actually in line with the previous research, research to say that um, women tend to perform self-care more than men. Now looking at the race, so also pretty skewed, we found that so 66% of people that responded were white or Caucasian and the rest of them were people of color. So this was the racial makeup of our sample. And then looking into people's income. So this I found really interesting because um, through the research we found that other people identified people who had a higher income were basically people who perform self-care and not people with the lower income. Whereas for us, what we found is that the group under 30,000, this is the lowest income category that was in the survey. And this made up 26%. Whereas the highest um, income group, which is 70,000 or more, and that made up 28%. So not that much of a difference, only three individual difference. And it's very strange that the med everything in the middle were actually less. So I found this really interesting and this is what we found in terms of the income. Next we look at um, education. So in the previous research they said that people with higher education perform self-care and this is similar to what we found. Those with a bachelor's degree made up the majority which is 39.9 percent and then followed by people with some college degree and, and then master's degree after that. Note that people with below high school diploma is the lowest uh, number of people that responded to our survey who were interested in self-care. So, hold on a minute. Okay. So then we looked into, oh, this thing is. There seems to be four people who won't identify themselves as any demographic. Yes. Consistently on every slide. Yes. That was the four people from the very first slide as well. Um, and then, then we looked into um, whether or not people actually practice self-care. And we found that a great 89% actually said yes um, to the same definition that I gave earlier in the presentation. So 89% of people said yes, they did do some form of self-care. And then very little people said no, 3%, and then some said maybe, but also 5% didn't respond to whether or not they um, did some form of self-care. So as I mentioned like before, because of the way we were sampling people, um, the sample really reflected on whether or not uh, we, people actually perform self-care. So then we asked people, if you do self-care, what do you do? And now we look at the actual domains themselves. So physical activities, physical domain, 
um, the people reflected and said, you know, they 74% of them have good eating habits. So that's the majority um, in terms of the physical domain. And then followed by a 65% said so they engage in some form of physical activity. And I just found it really interesting because when we talk about good eating habits that, is, that are beneficial for health, we're talking about having a plant-focused diet and we're also talking about eating, stop eating when you're 80% full. And not that many people actually said yes to these, but then they actually said yes to having good eating habits. So they think that they are having good eating habits, but the definition actually varies from person to person. Um, so this is looking at the physical domain itself. Um, And then we move on to the psychological domain, which is the second domain. Um, and in the second domain, we found that 66% within psychological domain practice mindfulness and then 63% practice self-praise, whereas not that many people actually um, write in a journal or engage in therapy. And I find this, um, there is a great skew in this because practicing mindfulness and practicing self-praise is actually a very internal practice. You do it pretty much yourself and it's very self-reflective, which is, you know, is, it is part of the psychological domain. But then when you're actually writing a journal, engaging in therapy, that is an expressive um, way of self-awareness and that is lacking compared to um, the internal practice of um, self-care in the psychological domain. And then the emotional domain, a lot of people spend time with friends and family and that is great. And a lot of people also experience laughter, which is great. So people tend to do very well in this area, in the emotional domain, um, compared to the other um, three domains. And then finally, spiritual domain. A lot of people were in nature, um, and then followed by some that engaged in prayer, and then not that many people did um, meditation or attend religious or spiritual events in comparison to that. And then I looked into um, all of the activities combined, so not separated into the various domains, and then seeing what do people do and in which domain in comparison to the others as a group. So I looked into this and the top six, so spend time with friends and family, um, that's the emotional domain, experience laughter, emotional domain, having good eating habits, physical, uh, physical activity is also a physical domain, having adequate sleep, another physical domain, being in nature was a spiritual domain. So these six, more than half of the uh, people that responded to our survey actually um, said they did these six things, whereas the rest of them, not so much. And what's missing here is the psychological domain. So that's something that people are not practicing as um, much as these other domains. And in order for self-care to be the most effective, uh, it has to be all rounded. It should be done within all of the uh, different domains. And it also should be done regularly and consistently. So after looking at what people did um, and didn't do, we wanted to know how often they did it because you know, if they're not doing it very often, then it may not actually be effective. This dashboard is jam-packed with information. Um, so at the bottom, the x-axis, it actually shows you what, um, what activity it is that you know, we were asking. And then on the y-axis is the percentage of total number of individuals um, that performed whatever it is that they were doing. And the size of the um, circle represents the num like the larger the size, the more people, and the color represents the frequency. So because we know that um, you know having we need people to do self care regularly and consistently, let's just look at things that are being done um, at least once a week. So let's start with um, more than once a day. So I just highlighted things that uh, were being done more than once a day. So the highest here is having good eating habits which is 46% of people um, do it more than once a day. And as you can tell, this is actually the highest frequency. I mean, the highest number of people in this group, and that's less than half. So less than half of the amount of people actually um, do self-care regularly and consistently. And we can see, you know, very little people attend religious or spiritual events, and less than 10% was a part of community. Um, 
very few people, were, they were all in the lower end of things um, when it comes to doing something more than once a day. And then when we look at things that are done once a day, this is lower. So the greatest in thing number of, the greatest um, activity that's being done once a day is having adequate sleep. Um, but that's only about 30% of people. So the remaining 70% of people don't actually have um, adequate sleep every day, uh, which is a great problem because sleep is very important as part of self-care. Um, and it's, it's also very important for health. And you can tell that everything else is actually in the lower part of the um, visualization on this dashboard. So people are not doing um, things self-care wise, you know, often enough. And then we look into things that are done more than once a week. They're also in the lower end of um, the visualization and the dots are really, really small. So we're talking about three people out of 193 people. And then, you know, spending time with friends and family, we're talking about 42 people, so very few people, and they do it more than once a week, which is great, but probably not sufficient um, in terms of have, reflecting what they practiced into efficacy and effectiveness. Um, so there's lots of information on this dashboard. I'm not gonna go any further, but I'm sure Dr. Mili can share um, this information and you can play around with it. Um, when you hover your mouse over, it actually gives you more information as to um, what that little dot means. So after we looked into what people were doing and we know that people weren't doing that much self-care, uh, even though they were doing self-care, we wanted to know if they thought that it was effective. And I found this highly interesting because people found that it was effective. And most of the, uh, so more than half of the population found that they had a better mindset seem to say more positive more often, their mind were more focused, they cope with stress better, um, and they feel good. And it's interesting because all of these um, effectiveness measures that we used were all mentally and psychologically focused, um, even though people said that they didn't actually do much psychological domain um, self-care activities. And this is a really great sign to say that only 5% of the total population that we surveyed found that they don't know if it was effective. So everybody else knew that what they were doing were effective in some shape or form. And obviously as one of the main goals of NEMAC Coach is to keep um, people out of doctor's offices and keep them healthy. And um, only 11% said that they see the doctor less frequently, but because um, we were not actually segregating people, whether or not they have a chronic disease or they don't have a chronic disease because we wanted to include everybody. So we couldn't actually pull the information to separate people um, and to say, okay, maybe if you do have a chronic disease and you're a senior doctor or less. So that is um, something that we have to work on and probably in future research moving forward from this um, survey. And because people were not doing um, self-care, as regularly and as frequently, this may not have reflected in whether or not they, we keep them out of the doctor's offices. I'm just gonna go back to my slides. So those were all the results. And the very last thing to share with you in terms of the results was the open-ended question that we asked on people's um, goals. So it was, like, it was an open-ended question. People can type in what they thought, what, you know, what their goals were. And from all the responses that we got on 93, 193 of them, we pulled um, the main themes and the words that were used most often and came up with this word cloud. And it's very obvious that um, and this makes me very happy because people are actually doing self-care for health um, and for a happier life and better health and for stress management. So it's good to know that people are doing self-care and they're doing it for health. So in conclusion, um, the results of our study and our project was that people are doing self-care, but most of them were doing it mainly from the physical and emotional domains, whereas the psychological and spiritual domains are not being done as often probably because people don't actually think that could be um, something to do with self-care. Um, people were also not doing it as frequently uh, for the maximum benefit that they can get. So for it to be effective, it has to be done regularly and consistently. And this is something that we can work on um, 
But despite the low frequency, people are still experiencing the benefits of doing self-care. So imagine if you were doing it really regularly, consistently across all five domains, um, I believe that you, the benefits will be more reflective as well in that sense. Um, so it, it could be possible that, you know, because people are not doing it as frequently, that's why we couldn't see um, the results in terms of effectiveness that people were staying out of the doctor's offices. So, you know, it could be that if people were doing it, then it will be keeping them out of doctor's offices. And this is something that we can work on in the future. I just wanted to highlight some strengths and weaknesses of our project. Um, so the, in terms of strengths, we really did thorough research on the literature. We really identified the gaps that, you know, that we didn't know what activities people were doing, how frequent they were doing. So this was the gap that we identified through the literature and that's why we developed this survey. Um, the survey items that we created, like I mentioned before, all the answer choices and the questions were really based on the evidence saying that these are things that are beneficial for health um, and not just any other um, action that we can do whenever. We also included individuals with and without chronic diseases as mentioned. So we really hope to actually capture um, everyone with and without chronic diseases. But we did have um, some limitations to the project. We have very small sample size and due to time, due to budget, we could not get um, a sample that was reflective of the whole US population, um, despite the fact that a lot of our respondents were scattered throughout the country. We were very selective with our sampling, so it was a biased sample. Um, and our study period was very short as well. We collected um, responses in about three weeks or less. So next steps, um, we identified the areas um, of self-care that needed promotion. So we needed to promote people to do more um, psychological and spiritual domains types of activities. And we need to emphasize that, you know, self-care needs to be done regularly and consistently if you want it to be beneficial for your health, which are the goals um, that were identified from the survey. Um, so in terms of events and programs, we need to think about events that could capture and help to promote um, these areas that require more attention right now. And we just need to continue promoting self-care and continue educating people that it is effective. You just need to do it regularly and consistently and put a little effort into it. Um, and in future, this project could probably extend and increase sample size and location for it to be more reflective of um, the U.S. population, which was our goal. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. That was great. I'm so proud of the work that we did. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Yeah. Really highlighted a lot of important issues and really answered a lot of the questions that we had at the beginning of the summer mm -hmm. and that Nat Med Coach faces as we're educating people on self-care. We, we know a lot more about the people that we want to serve now and who we want to help. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, But not everything was known either. We got some, some surprises like uh, that low-income people are practicing self-care and that's good to see it's good to see that it's not only higher income individuals that are practicing self-care mm -hmm. and it's also really interesting to see that um the domain the the benefits of you practice one domain and then it benefits on other domains of your life so you practice nutritional or physical self-care and then it impacts you emotionally and psychologically even though people weren't practicing enough psychological and emotional self-care they're still seeing benefits in those domains. And so that's very interesting to see also. I like the holistic aspect of that. Yeah. Delia, do you have any questions? Just the only question, I don't really have a question. I guess it's more of a statement than a question is until you um, introduce, I never even thought of the word self-care until I did the yoga class and you brought it the meditation class and you brought it up it was like okay this is something i need to incorporate but i tend to start and then i stop and as uh Celine was saying you have to be consistent with it so i guess that's going to be one of my goals is to just i guess decide on what i want to start with because i tend sometimes to start this and not complete it and then i start something else so just make a decision on what i'm going to what my first self-care check is going to be, I guess you say, and then try to stick to that until I master that and then pick up something else. 
And some you're doing already. So you give yourself credit for what you're doing already on a right. regular basis because you are doing that. And that is a good place to start. So if people are, are doing things already that contribute to their self-care and contribute to effective self-care, you do more of it if you're not doing it daily or regularly. And then you're right, then you expand the domains as well. So if you're doing more, that's physical self-care, but then you need to do more emotional or psychological self-care, spiritual self-care, then you go into those domains, which are the most attractive. That's exactly right. I think that's right. the way to build yourself, build your own self-care program out. And of course, we're here to help with that too. Now, I did have a question on one of the um, charts Celine, you mentioned about I'm not a I'm not a drinker, but it said drinking regularly, moderately, and regularly. Mm -hmm. That sort of threw me off. Why the regularly? So um, like it when was you found say drinking. You, you, are you referring to alcohol? Yes. So alcohol consumption, one to two drinks per day. Um, it has to be regularly. So every day, one to two drinks every day, um, it has found to actually be good for health. And this was through all the um, Blue Zone people, all the centenarians, they were doing this. And I believe that it is also a part of um, community building because they tend to do it over a meal with friends and family. Um, but they were doing it very regularly. But I believe that the US um, recommendations is that if you don't drink, don't start drinking. But if you do drink, then stick to just one to two drinks per day. But yeah. if you're drinking and, and, and it's supposed to be healthy, I, I, are you referring to just wine, like, you know, the red wine with the resveratrol? Or do you just mean any alcoholic drink? So the blue sun people tend to stick with red wine, but they were not restrictive towards just red wine. Oh. So, yeah, so it could be anything, but um, yeah, as you mentioned, I believe it's probably a choice of alcohol as well, yeah. but it was not specified in the research um, oh. what type of alcohol, but it was more towards the red wine. Oh. Yeah, and some of the blue zones are more still more tribal based. They're still more living in community dwellings. They are not that advanced technologically, which is another aspect of blue zone, which we may be missing that doesn't have to do with self-care. Um, so they might also have their own malt beverages from fruits or from herbs. Okay. Not technically something that we can find at the liquor store here. <laughs> <laughs> so there might be other, there might be additional health benefits to maybe there's a less percentage of alcohol. Maybe they're from roots or plants that have additional medicinal benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but the other caveat to the drinking is the not binge drinking. So it's, so as Celine said, it's one to two regularly. It's good for blood thinning. It's good for community. It's good for laughing. Um, and then there are maybe some additional nutritional benefits such as we know of resveratrol, mm -hmm. but then also no binging. So we certainly know that once we get into binge drinking, that is not healthy whatsoever. Yeah. And, um, and then there are certain, uh, you know, research, especially in the Americas on any amount of alcohol for like pregnant women or any amount of right. alcohol for women or, you know, so there's different or for people who have a risk for addiction. So we certainly do have to con consider those populations as well. But this is really population health that we're looking at. And I feel very proud of the work Celine did on yeah. the blue zones and also able to kind of capture these gaps and the, the knowledge that we have about self-care um, to look at the healthiest populations in the world and to look at also Americans as well as other internationals who are living into healthy until 100 years of age. So that's why we also included the centenarian research in there because there are so many overlaps between what, the, what people who survive and live a long time are doing, mm -hmm. what the healthiest populations are doing in the world, like the people who live in the Peruvian Andes or people who are living in Tibet. These are examples of the blue, lo blue zone locations. And then also what people who um, participate in all five domains of self-care are doing. So we can learn a lot from those other types of studies, types of research. And then Celine, you also mentioned mm -hmm. on one of the charts, I think it was one of the earlier charts between the boomers and the millenniums, I think. Mm -hmm. 
there was a difference between can you bring up that chart of course please so we're talking about the age group right right so the age group that we were able to um Yeah, so the 21, okay, decided not to. But the numbers were kind of small, so I couldn't really. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, so, so were you saying that the millenniums were more in tune with self-care than the boomers, or yes. was it the reverse? Um, so, the millen so the age group between 21 to 39 are the ones that performed most self-care. Um, mm compared to people who are in the 40s and above. Now, um, if you can answer this, I don't know. Do you, do you know why that is? Is it because, I mean, because I'm a boomer, but is it because there's less knowledge? Uh, like, I guess I'm trying to figure out what's driving that. There, are, I don't know the evidence behind that, but I believe probably it could be something to do with knowledge, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it's also a big trend, um, and a lot of millennials are following the trend of oh, actually doing okay. self care. But like we said, like before, we didn't actually know um, what activities they were doing, even though they said they were doing something. That does make sense because um, I think with all the people are becoming more health conscious now, I think, mm -hmm. than like when I was growing up. Because even when I try to share with my friends that are in my age group, it's like, they think I'm crazy. Like, you know, well, did you try this? Why don't you try to do it naturopathically or holistically? And it's like, no, they want to get stuck with the Western medicine and they don't want to try anything else. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really embedded in the society and what people think of the Western medicine and also yeah. because medication can work really quickly. Mm -hmm. So you see the effects pretty immediate. Whereas right. when you're talking about like holistic self-care, it takes time, it takes effort. And I think maybe that's one of the, you know, misconceptions. Right. And I think another thing is that people think that self-care is expensive um, and to, you know, you have to invest in it. I have to go to, um, you know, do really expensive yoga classes, for example, or, you know, right. something that they have to invest a lot of money, which I found really interesting. Like um, Dr. Millie mentioned that our income group, the, even the people with the lowest income uh -huh. um, group were performing self-care. So self-care isn't actually expensive. Right. It's probably education, like you mentioned, and we just right. need to create more awareness. Right. All right, good. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, we certainly... Um, we, there was some research done on baby boomers versus millennials and age groups for self-care that we looked at early on. Our research didn't include that exactly. I mean, we just mm -hmm. asked people's demographics. But the barriers to self-care for the baby boomers were in that research, not our research, but in that research were that they were skeptical about self-care, mm -hmm. um, possibly because of the language they hadn't heard of it, possibly also because... They just didn't know, they didn't believe necessarily that that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, as Celine also mentioned, um, you know, they thought that it would, might be expensive. And whereas with baby boomers, they're very excited because of the trends to try self-care, although they might be barking up the wrong tree as to what self-care is. And so yeah. that was yeah. another reason for why we wanted to do this research because we wanted to see, okay, we know baby boomers are doing, we know baby boomers are not doing self-care yet. They need to, why aren't they? Right. Mm -hmm. And then we know millennials are doing self-care, but is the self-care they're doing effective for their health? And so we were actually surprised, I think, positively by that answer. Although so few baby boomers responded to our survey um, and so, again, that could be because information collection bias, that people mm -hmm. just are not on the internet. They were not identifying themselves by hashtags, et cetera, okay. or by self-care support groups. <laughs> um, so it's just a matter of who responded, but we just didn't have enough information to be able right. to say, you know, why baby boomers are, aren't doing it and what they're doing. 
but they need to do, do more. We know that because we know yes. self-care yes. works. Yeah. <laughs> that we know for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we're a microwave society. We want everything quick and in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that we showed that was interesting in the research is that, okay, so baby boomers are sicker than millennials, clearly, but they're also 40 years older. So, and then there's also Gen X in between, but the millennials right. are sicker at their age now than the baby boomers were when they were young. Mm. And so that's something that's also not from our research. That's something from the Pew Research Center mm. as well. So, so millennials also need to engage in self-care because they are on trend to be mm -hmm. more chronically ill than their parents and grandparents, actually. Right. Baby boomers are the grandparents of millennials, mostly, right. you know, not clear cut, but... Mm something to think about yeah and so we are going to share this information as far and wide as we possibly can we're very sad that Celine has to continue on in her well we're not yeah. sad just to continue on in her education <laughs> we're very happy for you Celine. thank you yeah, all, all the best. <laughs> thank you um, but we certainly will be relying on this research for some time to come and sharing it and promoting it and we'll send this out to everybody who could not be here live and we will also make it available on the website in the future after kind of this period is over. But we do want to get this information out because it is that important. Mm -hmm. And um, Celine, we thank you so much for being here this summer with us. It's been an honor. Thank and you. Thank you. you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> and I've had a lot of autonomy in leading this project. And you have definitely just trusted me on this, which I really, really appreciate. And yeah, I, I didn't think that we would be able to find this information because, it, you know, some of them were actually contradicting from the previous information that we found. So it was really, really interesting for me as well. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll be talking to you. Mm -hmm. And so coming up on uh, Virtual Health Club, we've got Ali Might next Tuesday. She'll be talking, she'll be starting a four-part eating series on um, seasonal eating. So she'll be discussing apples and how to make the most of eating apples and how to incorporate them in recipes. And so we'll look forward to that and you'll be receiving all of that information via an AtMed coach. So stay tuned. Okay. Take Thank care. You. Have a good one. Thank you. All the best.